classical Indian painting. The focus of these five DVDs will be a survey of the great mural tradition. From the 2nd and 1st centuries before the Common Era up to the 1800s, the basic themes of murals will be presented and the subjects that they portray, why they were made and by whom and for whom, and how they were made with the materials used to create them. It all started with Ajanta, West Central India, or at least the Ajanta cave murals are the first Indian paintings we know of. They must have come from a long heritage of creative art before them, somehow. In painting, we can see two main categories. Wall paintings, or murals, as found in caves, temples, and palaces. And so-called miniatures, originally a European name for illuminated or painted pages in albums or books. And these are, of course, movable, portable very much unlike murals. But both murals and miniatures are perishable due to humidity, heat, insects, and humans, and end up looking like this or worse. Probably most of the earliest paintings, murals and miniatures, don't really exist anymore. The first and main theme in this art is religion, with Buddhism being the earliest, then Jainism and Hinduism. No other religions of India created murals. The Ajanta style, as it's been called, began as Buddhist art on walls and ceilings in carved out caves and was usually created along with stone sculptures, as we see here. Lots of Buddhas. The Ajanta caves are the most famous caves having murals from the second and first century before the Common Era up to the sixth century these are really the earliest paintings that still exist, with mainly very free, flowing, and dynamic imagery. Both religious and lots of non-religious portraits are here. Back in 1930, the director of the British Museum wrote, Whoever studies the art of China and Japan, at whatever point he begins, starts on a long road which will lead him ultimately back to Ajanta. So scholars in almost all Asian countries trace the roots of their classic paintings to the murals of India. The Jain religion produced much mural art too, but usually much more compartmentalized in boxes of squares and rectangles, so religious storytellers could jump around easily. Both very secular and religious themes are shown often together. Portraits of royalty are very common throughout many mural traditions. The festival called Holi was celebrated by both Jains and Hindus. Imagery is not so free-flowing as at Ajanta. Murals in Hindu caves and temples and palaces by far outnumber those of other religions. Tales of the god Shiva and Vishnu are most numerous. Mainly the religious figures and stories are illustrations to sacred Hindu texts, especially the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, and the Puranas. Murals are found in many states of India, but especially in Maharashtra, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, and Rajasthan. And the styles vary tremendously, as we've been seeing. I will deal with the different styles eventually, mainly in the chronological order of when they evolved. Birds and animals are basic motifs in Indian art, too, both real and mythical ones. The lotus is a major Indian motif as well, along with creepers and other flowers. In the caves and temples, the paintings are done on plastered stone walls, but in palaces and mansions, mostly on wood, as this. Girls swimming, painted on wood. And a fighting scene from a mural in a temple in South India. Such wall paintings were used as mediums of popular religious instruction. Show the art, tell the story. Basically, there are two types of painting techniques used in the murals that we'll see. The earliest type is found in the Ajanta caves and those that soon followed. Murals painted on dry plaster using the kind of tempura, water-based paint called fresco secco, Italian words used throughout Europe. 
And the second type is murals painted on wet plaster before it dries so that the colors go into the plaster, become part of it really. It's called true or good fresco or fresco buon in Italian. This kind is more permanent than the dry fresco even though they can look quite the same once dried. In the first drywall method, after the rock wall or ceiling of a cave or temple is smoothed out, a thick plaster of iron-rich earth, typically, was applied, mixed with some organic matter. A finer layer of clay plaster came next and was dried, and finally a thin coating of lime was added, leaving a matte, dry surface. We're not sure what tools the craftsmen and artists used in the caves, but these images may give us some idea. Colored minerals were ground and mixed with some kind of smooth gum or glue for adhesion, and then painted on the dry surfaces, a kind of tempura we might call it today. The dry tempura mural technique began with the Ajanta style like this, and is found in many areas in the south and in the north of India, Rajasthan, and throughout Central Asia and the Far East as well. So, early cave murals, the Ajanta style. Here we see Ajanta, Pitalkora, Ellora, Bog, all West Central India in Maharashtra and Madhya Pradesh states. The Ajanta style includes the art at these four places and also at Badami, further south in Andhra Pradesh. It's simply called the Ajanta style, largely because the Ajanta cave paintings are the best known and preserved. The caves lie in a great arc of granite carved by an ancient river. Carved out by Buddhist monks or four Buddhist monks beginning in the second and first century before the common era. Scholars have the caves well numbered. We'll see paintings especially in number 17 and in number 1 and number 2 and in some of the others too. Large monastic communities lived here, and the rich Buddhist laity who supported them hired expert cave carvers and wall painters in the centuries that followed. Although Hindu rulers were in power at the time, support came from Buddhist aristocrats and officials, devotees really. We get a better sense of the human scale here. All the carved out caves functioned like Christian churches or monasteries. Architecture, sculpture, and mural art together as aids in religious storytelling. A cutaway view shows the development of these caves for living and for worship over seven centuries. The Chaitya Hall, lower sketch, resembles in a way the early Christian basilica with a long vaulted nave and two pillared aisles ending in an apse. Here the apse is a Buddhist stupa, a symbolic model of a shrine or a pagoda. There are many, many sculptures, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and worshippers, all in conjunction with mural art. A Bodhisattva is an enlightened being who is dedicated to achieving Buddhahood. The images were probably all stuccoed and painted originally. The interiors were very poorly lit when I was there, and with incandescent yellow bulbs. My poor photo. Notice the ceiling. This is the same ceiling, but with different lighting, and from a book. Lotuses and elephants, favorite subjects. Generally, animals, birds, and flowers were painted on ceilings, especially the lotus. But landscape elements generally were very little used in Ajantan art. Thousands of Buddhas were painted on walls, still preserved fairly well. Most of the best murals here date to the late 400s and through the 500s, and a mandala on the ceiling my photo. The Buddhas again, in better light, from a book. Both of the two sects of Buddhism are represented here, the way of the elders, the Hinayana, and the Mahayana tradition. And the ceiling mandala. Sri Aurobindo wrote that the peculiar appeal of the art of Ajanta springs from the remarkably inward, spiritual, and psychic turn which was given to the artistic conception and method by the pervading genius of Indian culture. The earliest paintings are in the first carved out caves, this one now termed number 10, but not many have survived actually. They date to the second century before the common era. This was the first cave rediscovered in the jungle in the summer of 1819 
by a British hunting party. Buddhas and mandalas in the ceiling. This was the time when Hinayana, or the lesser vehicle tradition of Buddhism, was dominant here, and the Buddha was revered only symbolically. The art of this early period was supported by local lords and communities, not by royal patronage. So the murals are of a crowded, vibrant narrative art, teeming with people and often alive with drama. This earliest phase of work is very fine, and much of it is painted in a style different from the rest of Ajanta. Walls, ceilings, and pillars all adorned. All possible space is covered in epic style, a kind of magical Buddhist heaven of art. Now some close-ups, some details that have been recently been restored. Some of the technical aspects of the work with its choice of pigments and use of paint on dry lime mortar all show a hint of Hellenistic Greek influence. Many faces seem so realistic that they could be portraits of real individuals. Here really is the birth of Indian painting as we know it. These murals are also the oldest Buddhist paintings in existence, dating from only 300 years after the death of the Buddha. However, most of the Ajanta caves and almost all the murals date from nearly 600 years later on, during a second phase of construction. This was at the height of India's so-called Golden Age. This was often called the Mahayana, or Greater Vehicle, phase of Buddhism. This cave, number 17, is profusely illustrated, and its paintings are the best preserved of all. Looking in a mirror. Pride, beauty, and elegance together, as all women are at Ajanta. Surprising pictorial compositions from a very youthfully portrayed culture. Youthfully portrayed. The gracefulness and expansiveness of Ajanta art is not found in later murals, except rarely. Very free and dynamic. An impression of great space, along with a narrative sequence. The Buddha, portrayed very large in a monk's robe, he came begging alms from his much smaller wife and son. This implies a hierarchical mode of portraiture, meaning the more important persons were painted as the largest. Most of the paintings look like the work of painters who were used to decorating palaces as well as temples, and show a familiarity with details of the life of the wealthy court. One of the more beautiful images here is an apsara, a heavenly dancer. An easy sense of movement is evoked here. The hallmark of excellence at Ajanta, a scholar notes, is still the standard for the measurement of quality for Indian painting. The very first Wheel of Life image in India is in this cave. Almost all of it gone except for these fragments showing everyday life in the human world here, home and market scenes. The five forms of existence were painted, of humans, of gods, hell, animals, and ghosts. This wheel later evolved, especially in Tibet. And there are many views of kings and queens in various poses, receiving gifts from a king, court scenes, royal processions. Many Ajanta paintings show entertainment, music and dance, elegant clothing, conversing, drinking wine. All figures are outlined in black and rounded, but modeled in smooth colors. The use of light and shading is often very impressive. This style has been described as poetic dynamism set in motion. Lyrically lovely, charming, Ajanta. Sri Aurobindo commented on this, saying, this power of line and subtlety of psychic suggestion in the filling in of the expressive outlines is the source of that remarkable union of greatness and moving grace, which is the stamp of the whole work of Ajanta. Subdued colors were used, mostly limited to red and yellow ochres, a terra verde with lamp black and the white of lime. Even some ground lapis lazuli was utilized. Very good sense of movement, usually. The angle of viewing a scene was usually or often from up above, looking down at an angle. In a world without shadows, one commentator noted, 
Many of their limbs have the liquid luster of pearl. This liquid quality suggests the idea of waves, waves. Scenes of everyday life were all mixed together with Buddhist religious ones, geese here. Animals were seen as a holistic part of creation and drawn with empathy, a kind of Buddhist yogic equanimity of expression, as one historian wrote. A monkey and a bull endowed with human qualities in some of the Buddhist literature and painted that way. Harmony, compassion. The iconography overall is too complicated to get in here. These have all been from cave number 17. In later caves, the compositions often became more complex. Caves number two and number one have the latest Ajanta art from the 500s. Scenes from Buddha's life and past lives and many bodhisattvas deep in the caves. At Ajanta, Sri Aurobindo wrote, spiritual intention or psychic suggestion are the things of the first importance. They are all important. Subdued, elegant colors tempered with glue, not bright or flashy. Avalokiteshvara Buddha with an amazing bejeweled headdress. Unaffected by his own rich apparel, he blesses the universe and all within it. Compassionate, very serene. At Ajanta, we can see the technical skill in a way they have shaded the limbs of individual figures to produce a three-dimensional effect, even a feeling of movement in a way in the clouds. and in their use of white to highlight the nose, cheeks, and chest of certain figures. Often the lines and coloring changes, small inconsistencies even within the same cave, different painters of course, but only rounded lines, nothing sharply angular, a plasticity of sorts. It's a conceptual design at Ajanta. Both the sculptures and paintings have thematic parallels. Similar subjects and epic stories exist in both, and the rounded color modeling gives a three-dimensionality like the sculpture. As one approaches a cave, it is sculpture on the facade that is first impressive, as we see here. And then the paintings come to be seen only after getting farther back inside and your eyes get adjusted to the lower light. Finally, at the far end, sculpture takes over again with a huge Buddha figure dominating the space or a large stupa. The upper bodies of many men and women are bare in the classical style of depicting their aristocracy. This Ajanta style came to influence the development of art in Central Asia and its impact was felt in many other countries, both in painting and in sculpture. And this style influenced many other styles of Indian painting in the centuries to come, largely by pilgrims and artists traveling far and wide. Ajanta is a kind of tribute to beauty. And I finished Ajanta with the famous Padmapani, the Bodhisattva with a lotus. My picture here with existing lighting in cave number one. And more clearly seen here. His beauty comes from a muscular body and equanimity of expression, as it is said, a serenity and strength unparalleled elsewhere, peacefulness. Because of its great wealth of sculpture and paintings, many books have been published about the Ajanta Caves over the years. Our second set of murals are in Pitalakora Caves, just southwest of Ajanta, in a very remote area when first rediscovered by 1853 in a secluded gorge of quite spectacular natural beauty. Thirteen of them there are, and most of them were viharas or Buddhist monasteries for monks, and they were lived in. Patalkora was contemporary in age to the later Ajanta Caves, as far as the paintings go. Nine of the caves are cut into a granite arc, and four are across the ravine, lower left here. Only the Chaitya Hall, which was the stupa hall or shrine room, in cave number three here, has surviving paintings. The sculpture dates to the first century before the Common Era, done during Hinayana times, but the painting is from the fifth century, done during Mahayana Buddhist times, the 400s. 
The painted pillars inside the Chaitya Hall are where some Buddha figures still remain, most in poor condition. They still remain because the granite stone used in these columns is dry compared to the granite cave walls. There are 37 columns here, but some needed to be replaced with modern reinforced cement. Many Buddhas and some devotees, but no inscriptions. There is some similarity with Ajanta, of course, in lines, subdued coloring, and modeling. We have no idea who commissioned the art here, whether it was local rulers and wealthy patrons or great kings. Although the story of Patalkora's creation is unknown, the site has yielded many unusual sculptures and very little painting. They were done in the tempera technique of painting like at Ajanta, murals done on dry stone or plaster. The gentle expressions and tilting heads in the surviving murals here echo those of Ajanta. A closer photo of the same. This is on a wall, rather exceptional, that a few have survived on walls. The numerous Buddhist caves of western India would once have been all covered with exquisite mural paintings. Only one small area has strong color remaining. A devotee here between two Buddhas. And this is a computer enhanced version. It's redrawn for clarity and likely the way it may have been originally. Quite some folds of cloth as head covering, and very lyrical like the Ajanta murals. This book, Rock Cut Temples of Western India, does include Patalkora along with many, many others. The last Buddhist murals that we'll see are in five of the original nine granite caves called Bach, later dating 500s. Many sculptures of Buddha and Bodhisattvas have been constructed inside the caves, which were mostly viharas, monasteries, but each with a prayer or chaitya hall at the back. In 1818, they were rediscovered in another very remote valley, more north of Ajanta and Patalkora, and in the state of Madhya Pradesh. Some copper plate inscriptions that were found there show the date of some of these caves as 4th or 5th century similar in date to the later caves of Ajanta and to Patalkora. Most images are beyond recognition. The overall design was conceptual, integrating sculpture and painting together originally. But because of the great deterioration of the caves, in 1982 the remaining murals on plaster were carefully removed and put in the nearby archaeological museum of Gwalior, as pictured here. The cave paintings on the walls were reinforced so that at least the Buddhist sculptures could be preserved. So these are images now protected in the museum even though the colors have been faded and subject matter somewhat spoiled. The scene shows four figures in a discussion, likely religious, a digitally enhanced version here. The two at the left have highly ornamental crowns, probably kings or deities. The other two are ordinary people. Like at Ajanta, the walls and ceilings of the caves were originally covered with a thick mud plaster, but in a brownish-orange color, then white lime plaster over that, and then dried, of course, and finally paintings were added. This is seen as a dance group, with a male figure fully clothed and partly naked women around him dancing. Interesting scene for a monastery, but similar to Ajanta, for sure. This is the repainted copy showing the larger dance scene and likely with the original colors. Many of these images and fragments were part of a long Buddhist mural of epic pageantry over 220 feet long with cattle, birds, many plants and lotuses, and elephants. The colors were subtle and many figures seem just as vibrant, fluid, and lyrical as at, at Ajanta, in caves number one and two, that is. Curving outlines, well modeled with colors filled in. Sri Aurobindo was aware of the mural discoveries at Bagh. He noted that the spirit and tradition which reigns through all changes of style and manner at Ajanta is present too at Bagh. 
Here's a fragment showing two women, the right one crying into a cloth, the other one consoling, apparently. Very moving sense of intimacy. And in a mural, sensitivity. In K4 is a painting of the Bodhisattva Padmapani. Padma means lotus, here recreated for clarity. The lotus is right below his chin. Very reminiscent of the Padmapani in Ajanta. Was there a connection? Were some of the Buddhist artists here the same ones who worked at Ajanta or at Patalkora or descendants of them? During the 600s and 700s, Buddhism disappeared throughout most of India except in some of the northern areas of the Himalayas. Badami Caves In northern Karnataka state, an early Hindu capital of Chalukyan rulers was here at Badami. Four rock-cut temples were carved out of sandstone cliffs at Badami overlooking a beautiful lake. Much softer than granite, limestone is less durable too, so very few paintings remain, mostly in cave number three. These are Hindu, not Buddhist. During the 500s, devotional bhakti movements began to flourish around the gods Shiva and Vishnu and Krishna. And Chalukyan kings, who were Hindu, united most of this province. And Buddhism began to diminish. But the artists remained, and they had to find other patrons. So it's called the Western Chalukyan period, but it's Ajanta style in art. Entrance to the cave number three here, fairly preserved. Sanskrit inscriptions were found dating to 543 for the carved out cave, but these caves were never lost in remote gorges like the other Buddhist ones, likely because they are Hindu, here with sculptures and paintings of both Shiva and Vishnu. Many sculptures are found everywhere throughout much of the cave interiors, and ceilings too, like here, long lasting and with only vestiges of paint using the dry mural technique originally painted over a single layer of rough clay plaster mixed with husk, no lime, and almost all has fallen off. A hundred feet inside the cave, there still exists a marriage scene of Shiva and Parvati, along with the royal court of Indra, the king of the skies, and some devas. These resemble the figures painted in Ajanta, the curving features, the gracefully tilted heads, muted color modeling. They are hard to make out, so this is a computer-enhanced version. Here is a sense of intimacy, warmth, and relationship, and lyrical. Very little else remains that is recognizable at Padami. And here a modern sketch that shows Parvati even better, along with a deva. Scholars say they reflect the compassionate feelings and deep inward look which is seen in their contemporaneous Buddhist art, as, a, as at Ajanta. They are the earliest surviving examples of Hindu wall paintings, as far as we know. I found two books that deal with the Badami murals, but other general surveys possibly do too. Finally, the Ellora Caves. Just southwest of Ajanta and beyond Pitalkora, entire settlements of rock-cut caves were also decorated with Hindu images and some with Jain religious figures too with both royalty and regular men and women of the times. Alora has 34 caves, Buddhist here on the right, the Hindu or Brahmanical ones to the left, and Jain at the lower left. Only five of the caves have murals, Hindu and Jain, and very poorly preserved. Cave number 16 is the Shiva Kailasha temple, close to the center here. The work for this temple was supported by the king of the Rashtrakuta dynasty and he overthrew the Chalukyas at Badami, an era of Hindu devotional ascendancy and the decline of Buddhism. It's actually a cave temple deeply cut out of the living granite bedrock, but the painted art is also in the Ajanta style. Only a few fragments remain. On the ceiling of one of the temple caves, a Hindu god here seems to be in front of a mythic beast of some kind. So much of the paint has fallen off from the dry lime plaster with no glue used. 
Several elephants are better preserved enough, also in a ceiling, the 700s. The center one is redrawn here, actually rather cute. A large dancing Shiva with four arms, rather hard to see, done in the following century. With one foot on the ground, he is huge with many small figures all around. Hierarchical mode. So much has peeled off. Different artists, perhaps. A better and very dynamic ten-armed Shiva Nataraj. Cosmic dancer who dances the Grand Tandava dance at the end of time. The quality of modeling is not so good as at Ajanta, and the lines are more angular and thinner, and the eyes are a bit different too. This is in the Sanctum Sanctorum of the Rock Cut Temple at Alora. In the Jain Cave Temple, number 32, other Alora frescoes are in better shape today. They're on some ceilings and also date to the 800s. Jain celestial beings flying here, legs bent in the air. Voluptuous couples in movement. Jain angularity of line begins now. Angularity of line. The contours of the couples tend to be more sharp and angular and more abstract and dry in a way compared to Ajanta. More linear, more Jain as scholars would say. This is the most complete painting here. Most of the 21 distinct compositions can be seen only in parts. This is the first center of Jain wall painting known. These are the best of them with Ajanta-like color schemes. Marvelous movement of the divine Apsaras here, more curving, less angular. Most books on Elora deal also with Ajanta. The artists here had the most profound influence on all later Indian mural art, the Ajanta style, and later on the Jain school or Jain style, which I will deal with in the next DVD. Summing up this style of painting, all dry frescoes with a free-flowing, dynamic sense of movement, graceful, seeming expansiveness, rounded figures, first outlined in black, then filled in with smooth colors, most colors being subdued using ochres, but elegant usually, often heads are tilted as well. Subtle use of white, sometimes for highlighting, little use of landscape elements. Narrative sequencing, meaning the paintings were meant to tell stories and a hierarchical mode was often used too, so the more important figures are largest. The viewpoints often are seen from above, looking down at a scene. It was a youthful flourishing culture which is shown usually with bare-breasted men and women, beautiful and elegant. No old bearded sages. Many scenes of pageantry and entertainment with music, dance and wine, so that everyday life was well mixed with religious life. And as Sri Aurobindo saw, the paintings have the power of line and subtlety of psychic suggestion with a remarkably inward, spiritual, and psychic turn. Our second DVD video on murals deals with a survey of early South Indian styles that evolved from the Ajanta style during the Pallava, Chola, and Vijaya Nagara period of rule. No matter what rulers were in power in different regions, the art styles were similar, differing mainly in expression and sizes of figures all evolved from the Ajanta style.